I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. As any gardener knows or quickly discovers, one size definitely does not fit all. The plants that thrive in the Pacific Northwest would melt in the heat of Florida. And the plants that do well in the humidity of the Southeast probably don't survive even a mild winter in the Midwest. But there's one region that's the biggest wild card of all. In the desert Southwest, one might think that no plants really thrive other than the occasional cactus. But the reality is this part of the country boasts one of the most horticulturally diverse regions in the country. If you as the gardener can handle the extremes that mother nature throws at you. Today on Growing a Greener World, we go where we've never gone before to explore the unique beauty, challenges, and benefits of gardening in a place where the water is scarce, the soil is unforgiving, and the extreme heat is the only thing you can count on. Desert. Just that one word brings to mind all sorts of iconic imagery. Parched cowboys riding across miles of sun-baked earth, dust-choked panoramas of endless rock and sand, broken only by a lone tumbleweed or a tall prickly saguaro bush straight out of a Hollywood prop closet. But there's a lot more to the desert southwest than what you've seen in old westerns. North America's three major deserts, the Mojave, the Chihuahuan, and the Sonoran, occupy over 280,000 square miles of land that make up huge chunks of the states of California, Nevada, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. But far from the scorched wasteland usually depicted in the movies, the real desert Southwest is a thriving ecosystem all its own. And there are few places where that's more evident than the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix. Brian Kissinger is the director of horticulture. People ask me about the Sonoran Desert and the Desert Botanical Garden in particular. What is a Sonoran Desert? What's the sense of place here? It's a lower subtropical desert um, with some nights of frost in the winter, maybe you know two or three, and summer temperatures that can be up close to 120, you know, and everything in between. It's the lushest desert on the planet because we do get up to 12 inches of rain a year. The only thing is the rain comes like in two times in that year. People don't realize that the deserts here, are there's multiple deserts. There's a lower desert, which is the most lush, diverse desert of all. There's an intermediate desert, which is higher um, oak pinyon forest. And there's high desert, which is just, you know, agaves and things that grow at higher elevation. As a kid, I really love these plants. I mean, as an eight-year-old, I built a greenhouse with my dad. I collected cactus. I always thought I want to be near these really cool sculptural form plants. And actually to work with them in a landscape is challenging because they're so unique in shape and form to begin with. And how you put it all together, it takes an art form to really look at these plants and see how you combine their beauty. In the desert southwest, people think that it's really hard to grow things, that everything is so harsh and that things just suffer, you know. The reality is if you learn the plant palette and you create the right environment, you can grow a lot of plants here. And I think if we duplicate that in our home gardens, you'll have real success here. Brian has certainly achieved a remarkable success with his own landscape. With a background in landscape design, he's transformed his own yard into a stunning example of just how lush and complex a desert landscape can be. Brian, you talk a lot about shade as being one of the keys to success in gardening in the desert. And here we are in your beautiful personal landscape and you have a lot of shade here. Talk to me about some of the ways that you use shade in this garden. You know, in planting this garden, it was really important to create the canopy first 
give protection to all the plants I want to grow, like the cycads, the palms, uh, the aloes below, and the lilies, because that afternoon sun from uh, midday you know, to late afternoon is, is, is crucial to have protection from that to grow these plants. It also helps them uh, with uh, transpiration of water, having the shade to protect them. And everything in this garden is no older than four years, right? Correct. But without the protection of those trees first, you wouldn't have nearly the growth and this the massing that you've got and how everything looks so lush right now. It's that critical, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think it's also important when you think about trees creating the layers from top, you know, to bottom. Think of the trees are going to be tallest, like 60 feet, to the mid-level trees, and that gives you this feeling of a vertical gardening, which when you're walking through a small space, it's nice to be able to look up and see multiple layers. So not only do you get the function and the protection of having those trees in place, but you get the verticality, which provides the aesthetics as well. It makes it interesting. Yeah. Brian, as I stand in this space and I look around, the word that comes to mind first is lush from the ground covers up to the canopy trees. But you fill the space wherever the eye lands, and I love that. But let's start with the ground cover. And I think the first thing I want to clarify here is that I think it's fair to say that a lot of people think of ground cover as those plants that literally hug the ground and they always stay very low. But you have ground covers here that completely are not that at all. So tell me about some of the ones that you're using here. Absolutely, the trailing rosemary is one I use because it does well in this climate. Now this is a sunny area where this is located, so it gets more light, but it creates a nice undulating, you know, 12 inch to 18 inch tall, you know, mounds of ground cover which connects these plants together. You have a lot of accent plants in this mm. bed, so that is a connectivity, that dark green that ties it together. And then you look across the walkway, and then you have that wonderful drift of aloe, and it's just a completely different look, but it's also a ground cover. Absolutely, so the aloe Dorothea, the same thing, it's a swath or a drift of aloes that kind of pull your eye around that corner and send you on to the next, you know, uh, experience right there. Same thing with uh, the cycads in that bed. They're wrapping around, taking you to the next, you know, accent piece, which is, you know, the palm with the cactus on it. And there are so many great accent pieces in here. Do you have some favorites? I mean, how do you decide which ones of these do you really love more than the others? Well, right now, <laughs> it's the agave ovatifolia, because I love the color, the shape, and that powder blue and that strong form, and that's such a good contrast to everything else. And it really stands out amongst the greens. Yeah. Um, also, I love the Bismarck palm for the same reason. I love that powdery blue color, the strong fronds that plant has, and it's a plant from Madagascar that does really well here. And you get great height against that stark vertical space there, so it really provides that, Absolutely. that softening of that. Yep. And then what is this right here hugging this palm? That's an Acanthus cirrus, and it gets these amazing giant white fragrant flowers here in late spring, early summer. And that thing will hug the base of that tree and climb up, and I'll kind of manage its growth into the, into the, the crown of that palm tree. You know, there's a lot of great aloes that stay small that we use a lot here now for ground covers. And uh, the uh, blue elf aloe, which is blooming right now, you can see makes a beautiful drift and is a great contrast to plants like rosemary and some of the other ground covers, like the portulacaria, which almost looks like a jade plant on the ground. Mm. And of course the elephant in the room when it comes to gardening in the desert southwest is the irrigation, lack of rainwater. But you have an incredibly diverse plant palette here, and I know that some of your plants are thirstier than others, and you do a smart irrigation plan with your drip and soaker for that. But what I really love is the fact that you're harvesting literally every drop of rain off your roof surface and directing it into these beds. So talk to me about that a little bit. That whole rain garden concept, you know, was brought to my attention, and I thought, what an opportunity when doing the grades and all the hard, hardscape structures here to drain into the actual water beds so that when we have a one inch rain, it's directed to these plants and they're actually going to get a deep soak from that. And that's typically the monsoon season, which is just a short period of time during the year, but a lot of rain at once, usually. Correct. That's when the, you know, the winds come out of the south and we have our thunderstorms build up in late June, July and August. So we're talking about making the most use of the rain when we get it, but when we're not, it's 
choosing the right kind of plants that don't require that supplemental irrigation, but if we do have those plants that need some extra watering, we do it in a smart way, and you've done that by zoning off your garden with good irrigation. And take advantage of all the rainfall and keeping it on your property. Which your, yours does. It doesn't leave your property at all, does it? Nope. But the Desert Botanical Garden's 140 acres isn't devoted only to showcasing and conserving plant varieties for display purposes. A huge part of their mission is to educate visitors, many of whom may be recent desert transplants themselves, how to duplicate this kind of gardening success at their own home in this part of the country. I think the biggest challenge for people when they first come here in terms of gardening is learning our seasons, our seasonality. Um, seasonality works for us in a way that it works in no other area. Summer is almost our winter. You know, we stay inside as much as we can, the, uh, the weather's extreme, our, our plants are under stress, and so right now coming out of that is really a sort of second spring for us in the fall. Um, the temperature comes into a range that's amenable for a lot of growing. Um, our plants are starting to liven back up after a tough summer uh, and get new growth. Uh, flowers start coming out. It's really an exciting time for us um, when a lot of people are winding down in other parts of the country. Honestly, nine months, maybe eight months out of the year, we've got a beautiful climate to be outdoors <laughs> and the rest of it you just have to uh, adapt. <laughs> I think a lot of people assume that our soil, because it's not very organically rich, is, is sterile and that nothing can grow in it and that's, that's very much not the case. Uh, our soil has a lot of micronutrients in it, a lot of uh, minerals and a lot of life. You know, a lot, it's got its own eco web and if we can take those micronutrients and combine them with uh, more richer organic elements and there's really a wide range of things we're capable of uh, growing wise here. Um, it's a wonderful place to grow edibles. Um, we can grow vegetables and food and fruit year round. We start things like, uh, like tomato season launches for us in December. That's when we start thinking about our tomatoes and growing them in a, in a, a hot house, preparing to take them out in February. So even in the middle of winter, we're, we're kind of planning for spring. Tracy, I love how you describe your summers in the desert like other people's winter. Not that it's cold, of course, here in the summer. We know that's not the case. Mm -hmm. But it's that time where temperatures are most extreme. And you have to do some pretty creative things to protect your plants, right? Absolutely. Talk about some of those things that you do, starting with the things in summer. OK, so in summer, what we're doing, obviously, is looking to cut the intensity of the sun and heat that the plants receive, especially in the afternoon when they've already been through you know, quite a, a day of stress. So how we achieve that is through the use of something called shade cloth, mm -hmm. which is a woven uh, or knit material that cuts the intensity of the sun by a certain percentage. In this case, probably it's a, this is about a 40% cloth, so it'll cut the, uh, the sunlight by about 40% hitting the plant. And that's about ideal for these conditions, right? But if you mm -hmm. wanted more reduction in that intensity, you could have a tighter weave, and conversely, if you wanted less, they make this in a, in a looser weave, right? Absolutely, right. Because um, you do still want a certain amount of sunlight to reach the plant, and especially for our desert adapted plants, I mean, they want sun. Yes. They just don't want you know as much sun over you know such a period of intensity, and so that's what we're trying to correct for. Right, they still need to photosynthesize. Right. Okay, let's talk about winter, because most of the plants that you have here are not typically hardy for extra cold conditions, but you can cheat that as well. Correct. So in the winter time, we're looking actually to contain heat and uh, keep it with the plant overnight. So we use a shade cloth that's a, a light woven material uh, that we drape over the plant to the ground to trap that heat that's coming up from the ground. It's just enough protection to keep the frost off the foliage yeah. and then trap the heat because that's important. You want that cloth to go all the way down to the ground and you anchor it around the base, correct? Correct. It's very light and we drape it over the plant and it is very important to get it all the way secured to the ground so that the heat radiating from the soil level will be trapped underneath that cloth. And it's just enough protection to do the trick? Just enough to get them through those few crucial hours. No matter where you garden, it's all about the soil. And here in the desert southwest, it's radically different than almost anywhere else. It has a high alkaline level and contains a lot of salt. And that can make it very inhospitable for many plants to thrive. But if you can learn to adapt and master growing in these conditions, you can have jaw-dropping results. Just outside downtown Scottsdale, you'll find a veritable oasis. Welcome to Sing Farms, 
20 acres of lush greenery and thriving plants that might make you completely forget you're in the desert. But if you think the beautiful gardens and immensely popular farmer's market are what makes Sing Farm so extraordinary, just wait until you meet the man behind it all. So the theory of this farm was not only to farm and go back to what my father taught me, was to find a piece of land that nobody knew what to do with. So we're able to take land that we think is discarded and bring it back because Mother Earth is very powerful. It just needs what we took from it. My main goal was to make healthy soil. And this land being caliche, you really can't grow on it. It can't absorb water. There's no capillary action. There's no drainage. So the answer was compost. I went the first year and collected compost from three, four sources, brought it here, looked at it and go, nah, that's not compost. So really the journey began making my own organics. And that's what started what you saw on the back of the farm, is to make the soil healthy, I had to give it what was taken away from it. And what that's called is a soil food web. If you go in a forest, it takes about a year to make an inch of the undercover. But if you go by any major tree and dig down five, six inches, you will find the soil web. It'll be rich, it'll be full of microbes, high five fungi, and that's what feeds the tree. And my discussion to folks was what we discussed earlier, have you ever been to a forest? And they go, yes. And I go, how beautiful was it? And they tell me. I go, okay, who trims the trees? Who fertilizes the trees? Who looks after it? And they go, Mr. Singh, nobody. I said, exactly. Nature already knows what to do for us. We're the ones that took it and bended it, molded it, made up products for marketing. It already knows what to do. So this farm, I decided to walk with nature. I put my hands in nature and I did everything I could to be as compatible to nature to bring this soil alive. So I say if you enrich your soil with minerals, with kelp, worm castings, bat guano, compost, that diversity, all the selenium, boron, everything is then bounced and then we consume the plant that grew from there, now our bodies are bounced. I use a lot of things because diversity of soil is the only way to create high soluble sugars. I wanted to create that and show that in a desert, we can grow food 12 months a year, we can have diversity, we grow arugulas, we grow mustard, we grow beets, we grow carrots, garlic grows like crazy here, I have trees, almond trees, and the idea is that diversity again gives us something that money can't buy. It's a matter of rolling up your sleeves and building soil, you will know when your soil is healthy, it will tell you. You will go out there, you will be smiling, the plants will be growing, and it's a matter of getting to that. I think, I think it's the journey of getting to that that is the excitement. And once you're there, it's like, wow. But it's actually getting there that's the journey. And most people don't want to put themselves through that. They should. Water. It's literally the lifeblood of every garden, and it becomes even more of a commodity the scarcer it is. Every person we talked to in Arizona talked about how important it was to conserve it, and we should be trying to do that no matter where we live. But if you want the best tips on how to conserve it, there's no better place to come than where every drop is precious. One of the keys to a lush landscape is proper irrigation, without too much water, but just the right amount. And these days, having a drip irrigation system is one of the best ways to do that. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to set those systems up at home, because these days, you can buy kits that have all the basic components to set this up at home. And the main parts are just the part that attaches to the faucet and a supply tube, half-inch supply tube, that runs out to the area where your beds or your plants are. And then you connect a quarter-inch tubing. This is what I call spaghetti tubing. And you direct that right out to where your plants are. And then the final piece is an emitter. And an emitter will direct just the amount of water per hour to your plants. For example, this one will deliver two gallons per hour. But you can buy pieces that deliver one gallon per hour or even less. But your options are almost unlimited for fine-tuning your system. And then the last component that really puts your watering on autopilot is an automatic timer that's operated by a couple AA batteries. The price of this ranges from $25 to $50, but you can fine tune this to get just the amount of water at just the right time for whatever your irrigation needs are.
The idea of an oasis is one of those classic desert stereotypes, a thriving pocket tucked into the middle of some unexpected place. But as you travel around the desert southwest, you'll find more and more real-life examples. Agritopia is a 166-acre planned community in Gilbert, Arizona. But almost 60 years ago, it was just the Johnston family farm. Basically, the key tenants of Agritopia are in the name proper. Agra, which is preserving urban agriculture. Topia, trying to create the best community that you can. Now the very farm where Joe grew up is home to much more. Over 450 lots with single-family residences, cottages, a community center, a retirement home, restaurants, and at its center, a functioning urban farm with community garden. A really good community includes agriculture anyhow, and in most cases in our area in suburbia, agriculture is just something that is turned under and turn into houses. So we wanted to preserve urban agriculture in a, in a way that would work for the urban environment and also try to create a great community around that. But the seed of it was restaurant in, the, in our house serving the produce of the farm. That was the seed that it all sprouted from. One of the things we're really focusing on here is village life. And village life is something that you find around the world, in Japan, in Africa. Um, you find it in the Midwest. The idea of a village where people of all ages and all stages live together, they're connected together by not being divided up by walls or product type or that sort of thing, but they're, we're trying to create village life where people from all walks uh, feel comfortable and get to know each other. This idea of a planned community based around a real working farm has given rise to a fairly new term, agrihood, short for agricultural neighborhood. And if you haven't heard the word before, you will. It's estimated that as many as 200 agrihoods have popped up across the country over the past few years. And typically in a village, the agriculture is around it and the village is kind of in the middle. Uh, in this case, we've put it kind of in the center of the village since we're in kind of an urban fabric. But the point though is this, is that agriculture is super important in teaching uh, life lessons, for one thing. Um, it's important for people to know about seasons. It's important people, for people to understand that things take time. They take effort. Weeding is a problem. Weeding is a task. We need to weed things out of our own lives. We need to weed things out of the soil. So that all those life lessons and the confluence of, of interest, particularly by younger folks, in where their food comes from, makes the idea of an agrihood where it's a village, nothing new, but it takes patience, and it also takes someone who is keen on the stewardship of the land, that's willing to work 10, 15 years on getting it right. And Agritopia is getting it right, all the way down to the smaller scale community garden. Here, residents who come from around the country, and even the world, to now call Agritopia home, are trying their hand at growing their own food. Some bring years of experience. Some have never planted a thing but they're all learning together, and that's an important part of the journey. The Desert Southwest is probably the last place you think of for lush gardens, but it's really where all the gardening rules come together. Building the soil, treating water as a precious resource, working with Mother Nature no matter what she throws at you, building community and sharing the bounty. And it's certainly been an inspiration for me and I can't wait to get back to the garden farm to put these practices into play. And I hope it's been an inspiration for you too. Thanks for joining us everybody. I'm Joe Lample and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World.